the 2003 Detroit Shock were badass champions, were selfless, were incredible women. Changed the way women's basketball is played forever. Fade away three. Oh! Are you kidding me? This is go inside to Wiseman. He's got Grant Williams on him. Turns and lays it in. Williams went down. It feels good to be out there playing. Uh, I've been through a lot of adversity, but just to be out there playing and just God bless me with another opportunity. Like, I'm just truly blessed to just, just be in this position. So, yeah. As you look back on it, what uh, what kind of what's just your perspective on, on how it went down and why it didn't work? I mean, it's such a unique situation from jump. With the second pick in the 2020 NBA draft, the Golden State Warriors select James Weissman from the University of Memphis. Just me going through this adversity made me stronger as a person, and I'm truly ready. Uh, for, uh, just to go to Golden State and just to go and just learn as much as possible and just just be the best version of me and just work every day. I think he's understanding timing, um, sacrificing his body to set good screens. I even like the offensive uh, or the eagle screens he gets because he's trying to understand angles and timing and you know positioning and all that. But I mean, he's trying to do all the right things, and that's all you can ask for. Catch and shoot three. Wiseman keeping it alive. Wiseman putting it back in and drawing the foul. At times. Just throw it to Wiseman. Good things seem to happen. Let's go. Step back jumper. Yes. This his first 30 point night. We have some breaking news here on NBA Today. James Wiseman is headed to the Pistons. That's according to our Adrian Wojnarowski for Sadiq Bay. Wiseman was the number two pick for the Warriors. A lot of confidence that he'll uh, be around this league for a long time. I don't know what his ceiling is, but uh, it's a guy I want to see if you know, figure it out and have an opportunity. It's great for him uh, because he's super talented, super skilled, just haven't had the reps. Excited to add James to the group. Uh, he fits in because we need some additional uh, help up front. Man, last few days been crazy for me. I'm just get off the plane, just. <laughs> uh, doing my physical and stuff, uh, man, it was a lot. And then having the Detroit situation, stuff like that. But I just, um, just really just stayed present, just trying to take it one day at a time, just embracing everything. Uh, the young man, you know, he 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 knows how to play. He knows where to be uh, on both ends of the floor, whether it's defense, or offense. He's got quick feet to move, and and uh, he's about winning. It's not about himself. Uh, it's about winning and plays with a pure heart. So all those attributes helps a young man, especially a young player in this league, uh, to get, he, he's over himself. It's not about him and that's, that sticks out. I watched James, uh, you know, when he was in Memphis, coached by Penny Hardaway. Uh, but when he was in high school, I mean, he was phenomenal as a high school player things that he could do, his athleticism, the way he handled the basketball. I mean, we got a, got a good one there. You know, I know he hasn't played, you know, for a couple of years because of what was happening in Golden State. But in Detroit, hey, it's where you get reborn again. There you go. He's obviously a very talented player. Uh, that hasn't changed. He's in a new environment, new situation, and he really wants to thrive in that aspect. So he's been very open to coaching and, and trying to learn from his teammates. And I think that's been one of his, his greatest attributes since he's been here. Welcome to the excitement of NBA basketball. I'm George Blaha, live in Boston, with my partner, Special K himself, Gregory Kelser. Greg, I know we're both very excited to see what James Wiseman can do in piston red, white, and blue. Wiseman trying to get to the basket and does. James Wiseman off the square for his first oop as a Detroit Piston. Going to the corner, fires short. Batted around, Wiseman has it. He'll turn, fire and fill it up. It feels good being out there. My first, my first game, getting adjusted to everything. 
Uh, I mean, there was a lot of stuff going on in that game because I had to figure a lot of stuff out, but it was just fun just out there playing, having fun with my teammates. So. Facing hook and he hit it. Man, it's nice to see. I tell you what, I, I love the way he, his his uh, rawness and every game he does something to roll. Where did that come from? And so he, he's, he, I think he surprises himself sometimes. And once the game really slows down for him, the sky's going to be the limit for him. And that's why I think Golden State didn't want to, you know, let him go, is because the potential is there. Uh, now he's got to continue to work, continue to see it, continue to believe in it. This is go inside to Wiseman. He's got Grant Williams on him. Turns and lays it in. Williams went down. He was trying to get the bump call that yeah. the Pistons got in the first half with Blake Griffin. It feels good just to be back out there playing. Uh, I've been through a lot of adversity, but just to be out there playing and just God bless me with another opportunity. Like, I'm just truly blessed to just, just be in this position. Right, gets to the rim, scoops no. I think that's going to go for uh, Wiseman. You know, he looked like, you know, the Wiseman I played against in high school, uh, you know, offensively. Uh, you know, he could do it all. And, um, you know, defensively, just being a presence in that paint. He's a joy to be around. Um, he's a joy to work with. You know, every day coming in, he's eager to be on the court. He's one of the first guys in the gym. And it's just fun to be around. It's fun to have have that positive energy every day from such a young kid. It feels good because we're just growing together. You know, we're working. We're trying to push each other to just be better every day. So, I mean, I'm excited for it. I'm excited for uh, everything that's to come. The tale you're about to hear is a true, accurate account of the events as they occurred. Yet this story reads like something straight out of Hollywood. It begins in the summer of 2002 with the worst team in the WNBA, the Detroit Shock. So the 2003 Detroit Shock were... Champions, different. The best team that nobody knows today. Changed the way women's basketball is played forever. Left that year very frustrated. I just came out of college, and I hear I'm a rookie that went 39 and 0 in college and won a national championship to going what was it 0 and 11, 0 and forever? I don't know. Uh, before we made the change, uh, I'd head coach to to Bill. My name is Kristen Bernard, and I was vice president of business operations. So I started in April of 2002, and I left in uh, 2005. About two weeks into when I started, um, I got a call guy and he says, hey, you know, this is Bill Lambeer. And I was 27 years old and I'm, you know, don't really know what I'm doing. So I'm thinking, it's my friends messing with me. And that's when it started. He comes in, introduces himself, Bill Lambeer, and he says, how can I help you? He said to me, um, I'm here as a consultant. I want to learn the business. I think I can help you. He said, you know, I'm watching this team and I can see that it has potential, but it needs help. And so, whatever you need, I'm here. My name is Bill Lambeer, and I was the head coach and general manager of the Detroit Shock. Well, I first came in as a consultant uh, in the 2002 season. From that point, we started, he, he's like, you know, can you, do you have a budget? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> and so I got the budget, and we went through it, and Bill and I literally went from department to department to ask them questions about how they were spending the money. And at their 0 and 10, I went to them and said, you got a problem here. And then he said, you know, hey, you know, I think I should start paying attention to what's happening with this basketball team. I, I'm not sure that we have the right coach. I said, that would be great. I said, that'd be awesome. So he came back and he said, at some point, he's like, I think we have a problem. And so they said, the only thing we'd make a coaching change if you did it, so I did it. And then uh, the solution was really clear, and uh, it was it was going to be Bill Lambeer. Bill was a, a player's coach. Obviously, he was in our position before. Uh, he knew what we were going through. Um, he understood the grind of of being a professional athlete. Continue to pound the glass on both ends, okay? Both ends. So you see how we can get offensive rebounds against this squad. Don't give them any second shots. He's probably one of the most competitive people that I've ever met, and so there's that edge and element to him. 
Uh, he is what he professes to be, right? I mean, uh, the, the bad boys um, is well documented and uh, his part in earning that nickname, I, I think as well, but um, he's brilliant. The one thing about Bill is he definitely shared his tricks of the trade, but the one thing I really liked about him is that all of his kind of old teammates and the, you know, Isaiah Thomases and Rick Mahorns of the world, uh, the, um, the uh, you know, Dennis Rodmans and other people, like, he made sure that uh, John Sally, like, he made sure that we had touch points with some guys that he rocked out with. And I love that. Um, I thought it was really good for us um, at different points in the season. But it also was good to see some of those old videos that made us laugh. I don't know if we'll ever share that with y'all, but he would bring back some of those old videos from the 80s and then we'd be like, woo, what was y'all doing? What kind of outfits did y'all have on? Um, but it was entertaining. Like we all were able to come together, the barbecues, going out on a boat. We made it about kind of that family Detroit vibe and we all just rocked with it. We went from what was a women's college basketball scene to a professional basketball. I didn't care that they were women, didn't matter. We go play physical basketball, we take no quarter and we go to win and play every game to win. The bar was set higher as far as winning and how we do business. And I give a lot of credit to, to Bill. Um, he did not come in and treat us like we were a college team. He's like, look, I came from the bad boys, came from being a professional, this is what I expected you, and there was not a gray area. Watching him take over that team. I remember his first win, and uh, he brought champagne into the, in the locker room. And, uh, you know, it was like, all right, guys, we're gonna, we're gonna, you know, cheers to the first win, and then we're not gonna have this again until we win. And I thought that would be decades based on what that team looked like. But he somehow, like, he had a process he was seeing what he had, he was seeing what he had, he was seeing what he had. And he had two really, he had a few really good good pieces, the primary ones being Tweety Nolan, Swing Cash. And from there was, you gotta build. At the end of the year we got very good. Uh, it was clear that we had some players and they believed in the system. And at the end of the year, Tom Wilson asked me, well, what about next year? A lot of questions about the WNBA, and I said I thought we would be in the finals the next year, and he thought I was nuts. The next year we came back and we had a dispersal draft where we got Ruth Riley as number one pick because we were the worst team. My name is Ruth Riley Hunter, and I was power forward slash center for the Detroit Shock. I came to Detroit in the dispersal draft, so I played my first two years in Miami, and uh, our team folded, and then was redrafted, which is a unique situation, uh, to Detroit in 2003. And we never drafted number three, which is an 85% chance to get number one. We got number three, we drafted Cheryl Ford, which turned out to be arguably the best player in the draft. My name is Cheryl Ford, and I was the power forward for the Detroit shop. Let me tell you about the first day I got there. I get there, well, I get drafted, and they tell me, ask me what number do I want, and I said 32 because that's the number I've worn throughout my whole career, high school, college. And me not knowing, my captain of the team had 32 swing cash. So I was like, oh, embarrassed. <laughs> but yeah, it was good though. We, uh, I went with 35 for my mom because she wore 35 throughout her career. Well, they had to find their way. You know, Ruth Riley came in very late in the season for overseas commitments. So when she got there, we had about a week to practice with her. and. And everybody realized, uh, all the players realized we had something special. Uh, lost the first game, okay, but then we found our stride and then it was like, get out of our way. Um, they knew who they were, they knew what they were about. Um, they knew that they had something special going on, both on and off the court. And so it just snowballed from there. And then the whole season was like a great roller coaster ride. You never really look back, you only look forward and they really enjoyed it. Be confident when it comes to you, be confident when it comes to you. 2003 was a really unique team and uh, really didn't care what the narrative was around us. We were young, uh, hungry, selfless, and had a great leader in Swin, uh, had a great coach in Bill. And so every time we stepped on the floor, uh, we felt confident that we could run and hang with anyone. 
Bill put all the pieces together and we knew we had the, we knew we had what it took to win. So when we came in and we all, you know, everybody knew their role. You know, nobody had egos and chips on their shoulders. Everybody was just out to win. I have to give a lot of credit to, I mean, our chemistry, our camaraderie, it started with the humans we had, right? I, I felt like the locker room vibe was different. It's been a lot, lot, lot more fun. Uh, this year, you know, you go out to the games knowing that you're gonna win, instead of, you know, hoping that we win the games. You know, last year we were like, oh, another game. We were able to find kind of that common ground where it was the locker room was fun. We could joke with Bill, we could joke with, uh, Pam and Lori, just like our whole staff, like it just really came together in a very organic way and it happens that way sometimes. That's the unique thing about winning a championship, there's a lot of ways you can do it and people often speak to experience being uh, a necessary factor and I think that the 2003 team showed that wasn't the case. I mean Swin and I had experience winning championships in college but it's a different game on the on the pro level. So yeah, the following year when we came in, I was really happy with how our roster was constructed. Um, I was super excited. Obviously, I lost the national championship in college, so I knew exactly what Ruth Rowley was about, annoying as it was. Um, <laughs> uh, I thought I thought that we were in a position um, to at least make some noise. I didn't feel we had the same team from the previous year. And then you just started seeing how we were coming together. Um, we were just playing so hard and we started taking on this identity that was us, it was Detroit. As we're going, it's like you see them start to mold themselves into the bad girls. And uh, <laughs> every good story also has a villain. And so we knew at that time, like this team was gonna be a villain. Uh, throughout the WNBA, but have these really magnetic personalities to go with it. Not just personalities, but they had game. When you think about Tweety Nolan, you know, Tweety Nolan, I, I talk about all the time, she's the best professional basketball player that nobody knows to this day. And so from there, we had a great nucleus of young talent, very physical, strong, and very driven, and the rest is history. We wanted to come from the worst team, and we did. When you think about the finals, um, it's really interesting because, I mean, people were talking about us and here's this, like, we were the young guns, right? Um, I think our average age might have been like 23 or something on our team. We were pretty young, uh, but we were hungry. And they were young and they were hungry and they were driven and it, and it was a snowball effect. It was just, it was fun to watch as a coach. Um, sometimes they had to like reel them in a little bit, but overall, they knew who they were and they knew what they were going to get accomplished. Win the home games. That's what Bill told us all the time, every time, protect your home, win the home games. And when we did, what well, I think we lost the first one and we got in there and we won the second one and we knew, you know, made the best team win after, at that point. After losing that first game in the finals and everybody, like, they were coming to celebrate in Detroit. And uh, I didn't sleep on the plane. We took a red eye back. Like, I remember pacing on the plane, I remember talking on the plane, and we were like, nah, ain't happening, ain't happening at home. And I remember kind of, he started going back in his bag and started talking about the Pistons versus the Lakers and how this was gonna play out. And you think about like, Coop that's on the other side. Deanna holds the rock on her right hip. It's a high screen from Riley, takes it to the right side now. Bounce pass, dish four, lays it up and in. A clear lane for the rookie. And so it just started taking on a whole identity of its own but I think the biggest thing for me was that I never thought we were losing game two it was all about win game two and then we're going to see what happens in game three but I never had anything in me that felt like we were going to lose game two and I say that because it was what we had built for the whole year like our backs being against the wall people not thinking we could win certain games like I never felt any kind of pressure I was actually pissed because I wanted to play the game the next day the most important thing actually was winning game two. And you know, and LA knew what they were doing, we didn't. Uh, so they took advantage of us, of our naivety, and, you know, and then they started blowing kisses to the crowd. They knew it was their last home game. And so that kind of pissed off our players a lot. When we came back to Detroit, uh, it was clear that we had energized the city and we were gonna have massive crowds that hadn't been seen before in the WNBA. 
and they just all bonded together and had a resolve about themselves that they were going to get this accomplished. Uh, I thought that going into that series, there's already heated battles in a regular season against the Sparks. Nobody liked playing against them. They didn't want to play against us. Uh, so it made a, a fun rivalry and dynamic and narrative going into that finals game. Obviously, I'm guarding Lisa, so there's an extra element for me, guarding one of the best players in the world there. And then the uniqueness of playing the first game on the road and the next two coming back to, to Detroit and losing that first game, setting up you know, needing to win two at home in order to secure a victory and so many things going into that final series. The reality was, is like, we were ready for it. I remember playing, it was, you know, Lisa Leslie is the whole thing. And I remember going home and I'm like, I think we can win this. And uh, lo and behold, the rest is history. And you have to give Lisa Leslie all the credit. She's a phenomenal player, probably one of the best, if not the best in the world. So uh, she's a lot of things she brings to the table. But for us, we never play with one player. We play with five players, and then we get into our bench, and we bring about five more off the bench. So we're a deep team, and we're just going to shoot everybody in there and see what happens. We knew we had what it took to win. So when we came in, and we all, you know, everybody knew their role. You know, nobody had egos and chips on their shoulders. Everybody was just out to win. We wanted to come from the worst team, and we did. So the 2003 Detroit Shock were... Badass. Can I say that? <laughs> that he said, yeah. Right. Oh! Are you kidding me? DL went nuts! Six triples in the game! What's your secret? No secret. Uh, really just focus on the shot. The 2003 Detroit Shock were champions, were selfless, were incredible women who fought every second they stepped on the court. The 2003 Detroit Shock changed the way women's basketball is played forever. The inside for Ferris, spinning in the lane, forcing off the glass and through. Leslie got it back, lost it, game over! We go play physical basketball, we take no quarter, and we go to win and play every game to win. I don't think, I mean, I hope that the city knows how much our team appreciated them. Uh, how much they meant to us. It was a whole vibe in the city. I didn't know they say it now, but I'm talking for real, for real. From the basement to the balcony, the most improbable indeed has happened. Last year's WNBA Cellar Dwellers are this year's president of the league penthouse for the Inc. Detroit Shock are your 2003 WNBA champions. Believe it, the Shock our number one. One game two, the confidence was there. They knew that they would compete with Los Angeles all day long. And game three was a knockdown drag out affair. And we came out on top in the biggest crowd in history at WNBA. That is a moment that I will never forget. Coming back and seeing everybody, and we all got kids now and married. Um, it's just a great experience. And I'm so glad we're all able to do it. And 20 years later, I still can't believe it's been 20 years.